we need to talk about collectivist anarchism. Now, this is my second video looking at anarchism for edXL um, politics. And in the first video, we discussed the fact that all anarchists agree that there should be no state, we should maximize freedom, and there should be, we should find a kind of a natural order to things. But once we get past that initial agreement, there is significant disagreement about that, what that natural order and what that freedom would look like. And a lot of that comes from different views on human nature. And so anarchism splits very quickly into these collectivist ideas or these individualist ideas. Those of them that believe that human nature is more communal, more cooperative, kind of think that if you took the state away, we would organize ourselves into little kind of collections of people or communes. And those that have more kind of an individualist view on human nature believe that we'd end up with some sort of kind of anarcho-capitalism or, or um, egoism. And in this video, and I'm going to be discussing the collectivist side of um, anarchism. So, Collectivist anarchists, collectivist anarchists, tricky to say, believe that mankind is sociable and cooperative. That's our human nature. And therefore, we naturally want to work with others, support others, help others, support one another. And therefore, there should be common ownership. But you might be kind of thinking, well, hang on a minute, this is, this is socialism. But remember, socialism requires a a state, a government, sometimes even a, uh, you know, a, a an undemocratic state to enforce these, um, this kind of common ownership. Whereas with anarchism, there is no state. It's more that everyone kind of works together for the common good, because that is our natural kind of state of being, the natural order. Um, there should be complete equality under collectivist anarchism. It is, in fact, socialism without a state is what is somehow, somehow, sometimes how it's been described. And collectivist anarchists believe that we naturally have solidarity, which is a desire to form close communities. So they argue that we would naturally move and live within communities with shared interests, although different thinkers argue or have given kind of different visions of what this potentially could look like. And what we've got here is we've got three kind of different versions of how different thinkers have kind of envisaged how this would work. Now, my kind of recommendation to you is that you, you are aware of these three terms and you know a little bit about them, but broadly speaking, they are going over the same kind of concepts with minor variations. And I'll, I'll go through each one, but I, you know, you've, you've got limited time to study. And if you want to take a deep dive into anarchism and really read about these thinkers and these three different thing, thing, uh, three different theories, you are more than welcome to do so. And you will definitely get credit for it in the exam. But if you're looking for a kind of a broad brush understanding, they are three different versions of similar ideas. Of course, there are minor disagreements between them, but in terms of an essay, you're really going to be putting the collectivist theories up against the individualist theories. So you're more often going to be writing, well, this collectivist, this, coll this collectivist agrees with this other collectivist, and they all agree with this other collectivist, that blah, 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 blah. But on the other hand, individualists um, think blah, 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 blah. But on the other hand, they all agree that there should be no state. You know, that that's your kind of... Um, template for an anarchist answer or, or, or kind of a straightforward anarchist answer but you do have um what's come what is kind of known as anarcho-communism don't just write communism stick an anarcho on the front um which which believes that we should get small communities where membership is voluntary property is communal you know it does feel a lot like socialism trade um, it goes between communes on a, on a mutually beneficial basis and our thinker here is going to be kropotkin who i'm going to be looking at in more different in more detail i'm going to speed through these quite quickly and, and because i want to talk about the thinkers when we get there um we've got proudhon who is a thinker behind um mutualism um who thinks that goods should be exchanged based on how much labor was kind of put into making them so if i if i spent um five minutes to make this then that would be worth less than something that took me three days to make um so so trade is, is is based on the the time that is put into it so we have we have a system of trade here but it's not capitalism um small communities based on um similar crafts and we have syndicalism uh, i don't know if i can move myself out of the way so i can do it. yes i can Whoop. Um, syndicalism, which is that workers should organize into trade unions and use that direction to kind of fight for their rights. Common occupations will kind of breed brotherhood. 
Um, and so the idea, so what we're seeing here is three different ways in which these small communities would be formed and would be, and people would kind of live together, work together, support one another, and have that kind of fraternity and um, and and desire. So let's let's start to add a little bit more to each of these theories and look at the thinkers as we do so. So our first thinker is a Russian named Peter Kropotkin, and he is he's born in Moscow into a fairly aristocratic um, family. And he's writing before the Russian Revolution. So we're, we're talking here at the period of kind of czars and kind of emperors across this kind of time. We're, we're, we're the late 1800s. And he's seeing a country which has, has a very, very strong undemocratic state. And he's seeing poverty. Because um, remember, the Russian Revolution kind of comes, you know, massive workers' revolution to kind of bring socialism and communism into in a kind of place. So this is a pretty measurable time. And you're actually going to see that a lot of our thinkers on collectivist, on the collectivism side, have a connection to either kind of Russia or, or Eastern Europe, because this is a pretty miserable time. And all of the, all of all of our ideological thinkers identify a problem with their current societies and their current states, and they write about how they would improve them. Um, and so, what he is seeing is this incredibly powerful, and yet ineffective useless um kind of di dictatorship of czars and is writing well how could we make this better and obviously later you get kind of thinkers like marx and others who are kind of you know providing kind of socialist so solutions but kropotkin argues that the state itself because he's an anarchist is part of the problem which we can kind of see if we kind of put ourselves in his shoes and look through his eyes, we can kind of see why he would reach this conclusion that the state itself is um, part of the issue. And like most of our thinkers, he starts off with human nature. He argues that mankind is a sociable animal. We, we, we want to help each other. We are, we are not just wanting to shut ourselves off for everyone. We are responsible for one another as well as um, our, ourselves. And he takes a lot of his inspiration from nature. He's, he's, he's um, like many of our thinkers, they're very intelligent with a wide range of interests that have studied huge amounts of different kind of scientific phys and, 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 and psychological and philosophical disciplines. And he kind of combines his ideas of, of looking at nature with his ideas of political theory. And he says, look, cooperative animals are more successful. And human beings are naturally cooperative animals and he, he's particularly inspired by bees and ants which as creatures work together for the common good and he, he says you know don't compete and he, he's directly kind of um, referencing um, capitalism and kind of um, and perhaps maybe implying towards meritocracies and certainly inequalities in society you know don't compete competition is injurious Injurious, there you go, which is a word we don't really use anymore, but you can kind of see that it means injury, to hurt, to harm. So, And he's arguing that this competing with one another to kind of scrabble to the top will lead to harm for everyone involved, perhaps maybe with the exception of those who are at the very top. And he keeps going back to these points, you know, bees and ants, bees and ants. Look at these communities where everyone, these animal communities, where everyone works together and there is a successful hive for want of a better word. Um, we should be like that. And so he writes and he develops a theory which he calls mutual aid. And we're also going to kind of refer to under the heading of anarcho-communism. You know, this is a form of communism, but does not have um, a state. And he argues that mutual means kind of like uh, when, when, when two or more things or people kind of work together for mutual kind of benefit and aid is obviously to kind of um, assist um, one another. So this that's definitely a key phrase or key word you should be using here. And he argues that trade should take place through a voluntary exchange of, of, of goods. You, know, you give me that, I'll give you this. And but it's all for mutual benefit. You know, I will give you this because it will benefit you and you will give me that because it benefits me. Everyone wants 
the best for everyone else you know look at the look at the whole kind of set of bubbles so far cooperative animals are more successful your mankind is a success is a social animal so in the, under his ideas you don't kind of go well this is worth this and this is worth this we kind of go okay we are going to exchange but it's we're going to make sure that it's to benefit um both of us capitalism creates competition it is not about so that so he's saying this is bad it is not about getting as much as you can in a trade. It is not about uh, attempting to uh, exploit someone else to kind of gain as much um, wealth or property um, as you can. These are wrong. So under under his ideas, there is no private property. There is no exploitation of either workers or, or consumer. It is all about mutually beneficial trade and small self-sufficient communities, which has helpfully just appeared. Um, but behind my head here um he kind of he was very inspired and this is a story that would be good to put into a into an essay he's he goes to visit this um little group of watchmakers let me just double check which country he goes to um he's very inspired by a trip to a swedish watchmakers community um which he visits and this this swedish watchmakers community are uh, they kind of have cooperative production pooled resources and they share everything that they kind of get from these um from from selling these watches and so he kind of sees this little community of watches in 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 switzerland and kind of sees this on a far larger scale and say well why can't every society be like this you know why can't everyone live in one of these small self-sufficient communities producing whatever goods it might be and then trade with other communities on a system of kind of voluntary exchange um for mutual um, benefit. So, you know, uh, you, you might want to kind of read up a bit more about his little visit to a, wa a watch fact, a watch commune, um, or just kind of take my word for it. But you know, th this is this is his inspiration um, for his kind of writing. He, you know, it, it, like 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 many of us, he kind of has a bit of a, a life changing moment, a bit of an epiphany when he goes away somewhere, sees something different, and goes, you know, why don't we do this like this? And so he goes to these watchmakers, and he he kind of sees the future, and it's communal. So. Being an anti-capitalist, he argues that property is wrong. There should be no property, and we should have absolute economic equality. He argues that all is for all, and the, the, the longer version of this quote, um, all things are for all men, since all men have need of them, since all men have worked in the measure of their strength to produce them. And what he's saying here is that you know, it's it's a really anti-capitalist kind of kind of statement. You know, everything belongs to everyone. We all work, we all produce, we all um, create, and therefore we should all be the beneficiary of all. Um, and you might be kind of thinking, well, what if someone's lazy? What if someone kind of what doesn't want to work? And he argues, well, then they're going to get the disapproval of their community. Their community kind of won't want them to be a member of their community. And he he kind of believes that just kind of community spirit and disapproval of your community and even perhaps the ostracization you know as in being cast out by your community will be enough to inspire people to want to work even if perhaps they are lazier or or, or don't desire to to do so um you can kind of see this kind of similar idea in the socialist thinkers you know, remember how the socialist thinkers think that human nature is malleable it's changed by the society you're in and kaprotkin here is making a similar argument that if you're in one of these communities, you will want to work because it's what you do. It's what everyone's known. It's it's how, it's 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 what is seen as good. And if you don't, then you will experience the, dis the disapproval um, of your community, and that should be enough to inspire you. And so, this system that he kind of puts together becomes known as anarcho-communism. So, what do you think? He's an interesting thinker with these kind of animal references, this inspiration from 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 Switzerland. Um, could it work in your view? What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? How similar is it to socialism? And how different is it? Um, so think about that, and then we'll move on to our next thinker. So our next thinker is called Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. And he is a French um, printer. You can see he's kind of arty interested. And uh, he, again, writes um, about um, um, anarchism. And he's, again, he's writing in the kind of the mid-1800s. So he's just a little bit earlier um, than, our, than our previous thinker, Kropotkin. And he calls his ideas 
mutualism, which is not to be confused with mutual aid, which is what we've seen under under Kropotkin. But of course, we can see that this, is, this is still has a kind of collective element. But interestingly, Proudhon tries to place his, his ideas somewhere between collective anarchism and individualist anarchism, in that he's not an anarcho-communist, because he thinks that if you're forced to kind of live in these communities, these, these kind of communes, you're going to have problems. That, that takes away your freedom as much as the state does and so he proposes a system whereby you 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 kind of go somewhere between the two you you trade for mutual benefit but you maintain some of your individual freedoms as well so he kind of walks a little bit of kind of a tightrope between the two parts now think to yourself does that mean his ideas are incoherent or does that mean that actually his ideas make more sense let's learn about him and you can um, have a think now he's often called the father of anarchism the school bell he's often uh called the, he's often the called the father of anarchism because he's the first person to use this particular um term um and most theories most ideologies have someone that's known as the father of or the mother of um and and in this case he, he first uses the term and therefore he's kind of always kind of associated um with it now he has an interesting uh, theory about property he argues that property is theft, which sounds a lot like Nozick in liberalism, which we've kind of been talking about before. No, sorry, Nozick, who says that taxation is theft. So I've got that around the wrong way. Um, he argues that property allows one person to have power over another, whether that's money, whether that's factory owning, whether that's huge amounts of land. If one person owns and therefore is able to exploit another, then it is wrong. But interestingly, he does say, say that people should be allowed to have their own possessions. And he kind of talks about the fact that you, it's natural for a person to own their own home and have enough land and tools to be able to work. And you, sh you need to have enough of your own things, stuff, to have some independence, which is make, which, which differs him from um, Kropotkin. But where he thinks that that your possessions and then enable you to be more um, to dominate someone else or to be significantly kind of richer than someone else and be able to exploit them, then um, you've got um, a problem, and therefore that would be um, wrong. And we can see this kind of summarized here in the green bubble. Property can be used to exploit others but possessions cannot. So there's his kind of limit. So this is quite a, a, a thought through theory um, and um, idea of how this anarchic society should work. Now he proposes an alternative to capitalism. So whereas capitalism is based on currency and accumulating wealth and accumulating property, um, if you think about Kropotkin, Kropotkin says, well, we should trade for mutual benefit. You, know, you want this, I want that, let's trade. Mutual benefit, everyone's happy, everyone's delighted. Proudhon, again, is somewhere in between. He suggests that you should trade on the basis of the labor input of the thing that you've been made. So, for example, um, if it takes you, uh, if, if it takes someone four days to make a, a product, then that is worth more than a product that took you half an hour to make. Or if a product took um, a lot of skill and a lot of time and a lot of um, expertise, then again, that is worth more than something that that didn't. So we've got an inequality here on trading, which again makes him kind of different to um, Kropotkin. So he's arguing here that, that some trades, some communities, will have more valuable goods than others. And Kropotkin rejects this. Kropotkin kind of says, well, this this is actually just another form of capitalism, because you're still saying that some, some things are more valuable than others. You've still got kind of inequality to an extent. Um, but Proudhon kind of says, well, yeah, but we're not. We're, this is not capitalism. This is still mutual trade. It's just that some trades are more valuable than others. But what he does have in common with the with the collectivists and why he he kind of sits on the collectivist side is that he is very optimistic about human nature. He argues that we should remove capitalism through democracy, and by doing so, this will lead to mutually beneficial trade. Um, and this is where him and Kropotkin very much converge they come together because they do believe it's about mutual support they do believe um that you you can live in little communities if you, if you want but it, it's about a positive view on human nature that is supportive but we have some just variations about how exactly it will work his 
is he's the first person to use the term kind of anarchism. And so he defines it as this. Anarchism is order without power. Or to use other words, it's the natural order without the need of a state to kind of organize it for us. Um, and so it's, it's worth you looking at Proudhon in, in the textbooks or maybe kind of Googling and having a look at um, some of the kind of the, um, the sheets about Proudhon because his ideas are pretty well thought through. Um, his, his ideas about mutualism have something that is, you know, are, are thought provoking and you can definitely kind of think, well, where, where are, are his ideas flawed? Um, and of course, remember, he's writing in the mid 1800s as well. Every, every thinker is a product of their own time. Um, so think about him. So we're going to move on to our final thinker today, which is Bakunin. And so our final thinker in collectivist anarchism is Mikhail Bakunin. And he's, again, from Russia, Eastern, Eastern European, and he is a anti-authoritarian revolutionary. So again, similar to um, Kropotkin, he's writing at a time where you have a very strong state. And Bakunin, interestingly, is a contemporary of Marx and in the early parts of their career or earlier parts of the career they actually agree because they're both collectivists and they agree with this idea of community and, and and so on but where they split is in this need for a state and where marx goes down the idea of saying that we need a socialist state to create this public ownership and to to kind of create this equality bakunin argues he and rejects this because he says well even if you even the short term socialist state will simply need lead to a new system of kind of political domination and it will lead to yet another kind of corrupt leader you know so replacing one leader with another leader for Bakunin is pointless because you just end up with another leader and perhaps he was right if you look at what happened with um Stalin and and what what kind of did happen in, in Russia so but it's interesting to to know that Bakunin and Marx start from the same point which is why so many of these kind of socialist um collectivist anarchist ideas overlap because they do start with the same idea of human nature it's almost like you've got the same disease but we've got a different cure so bakunin's ideas um he, he they're kind of they, there's a few different names to them syndicalism federalism he's an anar anarcho-communist um, i'm going to be honest here i've been looking at different textbooks and different textbooks kind of use different phrases um i so um this this will be something to look on look at the textbook that you're looking at in class whichever textbook it is and kind of use the phrases there but there there are different words which are ascribed to him on different websites and different textbooks so look at your textbook and what your teacher wants you to use um he again similar to some of our other thinkers believes in communities based on occupations and the idea that he thinks that economically um, people will live in um, people people are kind of rational and they're autonomous, but at the same time they will kind of be, they are collective and they will want to kind of live in collective arrangements where they will kind of voluntarily abide by laws. They'll respect one another. They'll be kind of very sociable, but they're not being forced to do it because there's no there's no state. But they will want to create a uh, a kind of a self-regulating society which has common ownership and um where the workers own the kind of means of production you know you can see marx kind of come kind of bleeding through here and again similar to our other collectivists he believes in kind of trading for mutual benefit without the need of a state to organize it this is the key difference without the need of the state to organize it and make it happen it's the idea that there will be trade for mutual um, um benefit and he argues that freedom without economic equality is a lie. Now, this is perhaps a dig at the liberals, because liberals are like freedom, 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 freedom. And but then using kind of the free market idea that often comes out of liberalism, you end up with inequality. Bakunin will directly address that here and say, well, freedom without economic equality is not truly freedom. It, it is a lie. What do you think of that perhaps criticism of classic liberalism or indeed capitalism in general but he also makes another dig here at socialism he says when the people are being beaten with a stick it doesn't matter if it's the people's stick so and and i, I like this quote because he's kind of saying you know whether you whether the dictator is an authoritarian hierarchical hereditary regime or whether the dictator is a socialist ruler who's trying to enforce some sort of collectivism it's the same outcome. Whether the stick is an authoritarian stick or the people's stick, it's still a stick. 
And there's kind of a dig here that we can kind of look through history and kind of look at maybe the People's Republic of China and the is it the Democratic Republic of various places and whatever the the full title of North Korea is. You know, often these countries name themselves something which is like the People's this or the Democratic that, but the people are still being oppressed. But often they're just being oppressed in the name of the people. And this is the point that Bakunin is making, which is why he diagnoses the need for a stateless solution to inequality and capitalism rather than a state-led solution to inequality and capitalism. And so therefore he splits from Marx, as I've said, because he argues that ultimately power oppresses and power corrupts. And I think within that, with these last few bullet points here, you can see a lovely argument from the anarchists about why the state needs to go and so it, and, and as you've kind of learned about this you know, think about the socialist arguments about about why capitalism doesn't work you know think about the objections to the um capitalist system of exploitation that they were seeing bourgeoisie proletariat you know think think about those and then think about the liberal objections to hereditary rulers and a ruling class and all those kind of things and and, and put all of these ideas together and you kind of end up with anarchism. That that that's kind of the natural solution. Then is that we need to kind of get rid of the state in general. And he is a collectivist, so no property and absolute economic equality is what is um, required and what and what is is needed. And the the only real solution to the inequality that we get. Again, we're going to be trading based on the labour value, so we can draw a line here from Proudhon. Um, trading for mutual benefits, so we can draw a line here to uh, Kropotkin, uh, because we are a, a kind of a collectivist um, anarchism. And he argues that there will be, out of this kind of stateless scenario, will kind of emerge a natural law, where there will be natural empathy and natural cooperation, which brings us all the way back to um, our first thing of Kropotkin, where he's talking about, you know, we are bees and ants, and we are naturally kind of supportive, and we are collective, um, and we want to work together for mutual benefit. So, depending on how much you want to kind of dive into anarchism, you can either put our three collective thinkers together and be like, look, here are all the similarities, and your essay will work well like that. You know, almost you know, putting them down is kind of in agreement with each other. Or, if you want to go just a little bit further, you can particularly draw out some of the differences with our middle thinker which he's proud on. You can kind of almost argue that he's got kind of elements of individualism anarchist there. But of course, they all have a positive view of human nature. They are all collectivist um, to an extent, and they all agree that ultimately trading should be done for the mutual benefit of all, rather than some sort of kind of accumulation of property. Property is bad. Um, and so in our next video, we'll be looking more at the individualist anarchists. We'll be looking at uh, egoism. We'll be looking at two thinkers, Stirner and um, Emma Goldman, and probably then drawing our look at anarchism to a close. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, then like it. And if you uh, haven't yet subscribed to the channel, then please do. Take care. Bye.